Now that we know the basics of integration, we can start to look at more integrals such as trigonometric intervals. For instance, the integral of cosine cos x dx, well that's simply sine x, x plus c. Why is that the case? Well, remember that the derivative of sine is cosine, so the integral or the antiderivative of cosine must be sine. Similarly, the integral of sine, sine x dx, is then negative cosine plus c. Cosine x plus c, remember we add that constant in there because when we go to back to take the derivative, um, this constant could be anything, it would drop out when we take the derivative. So to be completely accurate, we need to include that constant because it could be plus anything and we'd still get our original function back when we took the derivative. Now note that the derivative of cosine is negative sine. So to get positive sine back, we need to we would need to take the negative derivative of cosine of x because then we'd have negative negative sine, which gives us sine. So it is a little confusing in that the signs are essentially opposite of what they were with the derivatives. Now when we do the thing to cosine, we get the positive, and when we do the thing to sine, we get the negative, which with the derivatives, it was the opposite. Remember that the derivative of cosine was negative sine. So there's a lot of little things like that to keep straight once you start internalizing integrals. Let's just look at them all at once and go from there. Here are 11 integrals that you should know Actually, I'm not entirely concerned about knowing number 11, so we'll just keep that up as something interesting to work with in case you see it in the homework or out in, out in the field somewhere. But there comes a point where if an integral is too out there, you would either look it up in an integral table or put it into some kind of computer program to compute it. Okay, notice here on the left we have the derivative version, and on the right we have the integral version. So we have the integral of cosine is sine, integral of sine is negative cosine, integral of secant squared is tan, integral of cosecant squared, negative cotan, etc. Secant tangent goes to secant, cosecant cotangent goes to negative cosecant. Um, integral of e to the x, of course, is e to the x again. Um, and all of these are plus c. I'm not saying the plus c, but, but it's there, of course, uh, because the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. Now, number eight we have to think about for a second. First off, recall that the power rule only held when p was not equal to negative 1, right? The power rule told us that if you take the integral of x to the p dx, you get x to the p plus 1 plus 1 over p plus 1 plus c. But we had to stipulate that p not equal negative 1 because that would give us quite a mess here both in the x and in the, in the uh, denominator. So what do we do when p equals negative 1, which is, in this case, 1 over x? Well, we know that the derivative of natural log x is 1 over x. So I'm thinking that the integral of 1 over x dx would be natural log x plus c. But when you take the integral, you want to be as general as possible. Right? That's the whole spirit of adding this plus c on there. So we're really adding on an entire infinite number of possibilities here of what c could be. Um, similarly, to keep this super general, we need to add on an absolute value of x here. Because the derivative of, of natural log absolute value of x is still 1 over x. It's a subtle point, but, it, but it's an important one. So the integral of 1 over x dx is indeed natural log absolute value of x plus c. Okay, and then we move on into the inverse trig functions. The integral of dx over 1 minus x squared in the square root gives us arc sine x or inverse sine of x. You know what's missing here is the, um, the integral, the negative, if we had a negative of this here, we would get arc cosine of x dx. And then we have the integral of 1 over 1 plus x squared dx, which is arc tan of x, of course. And again, this arc secant one, this is to the point where, you know, I'll, you know, at least say a dx over x rad x squared minus 1 is arc secant absolute value of x. But to me personally, that's where I start looking them up in a table or, or something else. It's just a little too much. So I recommend having all these memorized. You could sit there and reason through them from the derivative standpoint first, 
but that's going to be a lot of extra mental power that you don't really want to be spending, especially seeing as the rest of Calc 1 is going to focus on integrals and most of Calc 2 is going to focus on integrals. You really want to start thinking of this in terms of integrals. So it makes sense to memorize these as their own thing and not just consequences of derivatives because integrals are much more than just antiderivatives, as we'll see in the upcoming sections. Let's try some examples. For part A, we have the integral of the quantity sine theta minus 1 all over cos squared theta d theta. Well, once again, we don't have anything like the quotient rule for integrals. And it's not like we don't have it yet. We just don't have it, period. That's not something that exists. So in a lot of ways, integrals are more challenging than derivatives for reasons such as that. So we, we need to do something else to get rid of this quotient. What can we do? Well, let's see. How about we break this up into sine theta over cos squared theta. Uh, plus 1 over cos theta, or minus, minus 1 over uh, cos squared theta. Squared theta. All this is still uh, d theta here. And now we can simplify this. If we, if we scrape off one of these cosines, we'll have sine over cosine. That's tangent. Tan theta. And then we have times 1 over cosine. Well, that's secant theta. Ah, now that's something familiar. Plus, uh, I keep saying that, make that minus minus 1 over cos squared, well that's secant squared theta, d theta. All right, well now we know what these integrals are. The integral of secant tangent is secant theta, minus the integral of secant squared, which we know is tan theta. And don't forget the plus c. There we go. On to part B, we have the integral of 6 over the square root of 4 minus 4x squared. Well, we know what the integral of 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared is. I'm going to throw a dx on there. But what do we do with this 4 business? Note that the 6 just pops out to the front, so we don't have to worry about that at all. These 4s are kind of weird, though, but check this out. It's a, it's a great technique. You'll use it all the time, um, especially in Calc 2. So I'm going to bring this 6 out to the front, and then what I'll do, so this becomes just dx up here. I'm going to factor a 4 out here. This becomes 1 minus x squared. And then I can bring this 4 all the way out as a 2, because square root of 4 is 2. So this really becomes three divided or 6 divided by 2, which is 3, integral dx over rad 1 minus x squared, which we can clearly see is arc sine of x. So 3 arc sine or inverse sine x plus c. And it's always a good idea to take the derivative at the end of your integral to make sure you get the original function back, at least while you're still getting used to integration. So I would take both of these, take the derivative, make sure you get your original functions back. Okay, well, part c seems like there's no way we can do it with just the skills we have but I assure you that we can. We have the integral of the quantity x e to the 2x plus 4 e to the x all over x e to the x dx. Okay, well, again, though we'll learn some techniques later to deal with complicated integrals, we don't have anything like the quotient rule. So for now, all we can do is break this up. So let's break it up and see what happens. So we have the integral of, well, this becomes x e to the 2x over x e to the x plus 4e to the x over xe to the x. And look at all this cancellation. And all of this is, of course, still dx. Okay, well, we get some nice cancellation here. These x's cancel in the first term. And we get e to the 2x minus x. e to the 2x minus x is simply e to the x. So that whole first term simplifies down to e to the x. In the second term, the e to the x is cancel, and we're left with 4 divided by x. So this whole thing simplifies down to the integral of e to the x plus 4 over x dx. Well, we can integrate both these terms. The integral of e to the x is simply e to the x again. The integral of 4, well, okay, how about let's, let's bring, bring the 4 out to the front of the second integral. So we have 4, and then the integral of 1 over x is natural log absolute value of x. Don't forget that absolute value in there plus C. 